Hi, I'm Rick Tibbetts. Welcome to Unlimit Yourself. I'm glad you're here. In today's episode, we're going to tackle a difficult but necessary question, the answer to which is so powerful that it effectively guides the thinking, behavior, and lifestyle of half the Earth's population. The question is, what does it mean to be a man? In Western society, males are socialized throughout their lives to adopt specific masculine traits. But are these traits always conducive to positive outcomes? Or can they at times limit men's ability to lead healthy, authentic lives? Given how complicated and personal this subject is, I thought it best to invite onto the podcast Elliot Meyer, a true scholar, philosopher, and friend, to share his experiences with masculinity and help me give the term a healthier, more inclusive definition. As a man myself, I have inherent interest in grappling with what it means to be a man, but I believe it's important for everyone, regardless of gender, to do the same. So, let's get started. Welcome to Unlimit Yourself, Elliot. I'm so glad you could come on the show. This topic is one that I have been dying to talk about for a very long time, and it is one that I think a lot of our male and female listeners will gain something very substantive from, something very valuable. Today we're going to be talking about what it means to be a man. And I wanted to talk to you about this. I didn't want to just speak alone because I felt like you are somebody who analyzes these questions as deeply as I do. You're somebody who ponders them, their meaning, and how they apply to your life just like I do. So I felt what better counterpart for this discussion than Elliot Meyer? Well, thank you so much for having me. You know, I, it's when you first approached me about this, I was like, I, I was really excited on for a couple of reasons. I mean, first, this is, I think, in part because you and I have had some great, really enlightening conversations, um, specifically about this topic, but just in general, just about how we understand ourselves personally, how we associate with the world, um, how we self-reflect and how we grow as people. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I think that you're spot on to say that, like, this is a topic that really needs so much more. There needs to be so much more conversation around. Exactly. These questions are so heavy and yet they're so infrequently discussed in day to day life. Right. I mean, what it means to be a man can literally guide an individual's entire life. I mean, boys and men. They so often dedicate their lives to fitting into this predetermined mold of masculinity, this tough, unemotional, hardened caricature of manhood. And I believe that that pursuit of the stereotypical masculine image plays a significant role in how so many men live their lives and interact with others. And that's why it's so important to stop for a moment and reflect on what, act, on what that actually means to be a man and question some of the long-held beliefs on masculinity that may not be constructive to a healthy life. So before we get into that, I'd like our listeners to hear a little bit about your backstory, where you come from, where you went to school, what you're up to now. I'm Elliot Meyer. I grew up in uh, Northern Virginia. I grew up in Fairfax County. I went to Randolph-Macon College, which is in Ashland, Virginia. Worked for two years uh, for former Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe, um, potentially going to be the next Virginia Governor too, which is very exciting. Um, And then for the last three years, I lived in Madison, Wisconsin. I was the communications director for an environmental nonprofit. And I'm now back in Arlington, and I'm pursuing my master's of public policy at George Mason uh, with an environmental policy and sustainability emphasis. So, Well, thank you for sharing. Uh, You're a very interesting guy. And not only do you tackle the big questions, but you also tackle big physical feats. Elliot hiked the entire Appalachian Trail. He is a through hiker. Could, could you quickly just tell tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so I, uh, I'm very flattered, Rick. I uh, hiked the Appalachian Trail in 2017. I started in Georgia uh, the first week in February. I ended um, in Maine uh, in the first week of July. So it took me almost five months to the day, um, 2,100 miles. Wow. A lot of experiences in between. <laughs> My God. <laughs> so, That's incredible. If, if there's one place where you can really convene with nature and come to some deep realizations, I do believe that's where it would be. And speaking of those big realizations, let's dive into these questions on what it means to be a man. So I want to start off by asking you, 
when do you believe you picked up your perceptions of what it meant to be a man? How was that imprinted on you? Was that more so family, media, combination? That's, I, that's a great question. You know, I think, I first think it's really important to acknowledge that there's never an arrival point. We're always in a process of learning, discovering new things with the information, new experiences that we have, new information we receive. We take that, we absorb that in, and then we and there's that process of self-reflection where we're figuring out how do how does this fit within me and who I understand myself? How do I incorporate this? So my family is my mom, my dad, and my sister, and I credit my dad with not being too, um, I, I would say, overbearing in the sense of, of masculinity. I, I And I only say that in understanding and seeing, you know, how some other fathers were with their sons. And, and I think my dad had a really good sense of being able to express himself and, you know, explore, you know, things in his own career or his own relationships without feeling the need to be a masculine guy. Um, and maybe that's something that we can talk about within a little bit more detail. Oh, for sure. We'll definitely be getting into it. And just like yourself, I picked up my notions of masculinity through osmosis, through immediate and extended family, friends, peers, and I'm sure the TV and movies played a big role in it as well. But also it was the girls and women in my life too. You know, g girls and women are not outside the male socialization process. They contribute to it. So in addition to my male family members, friends, peers, I also received this notion of masculinity from the females in my life, too. Like most boys, I learned that to be a man is to be tough, to be stoic, to be resilient, to be uh, unemotional, firm, and assertive. And I'm not here to argue that that definition is necessarily improper. But what I do believe is that that vision of masculinity can often be taken to extremes and can be detrimental to the healthy development of boys and men. For example, the phrase, be a man, is so frequently used to restrict men's ability to be as honest and expressive as they'd like to be. So I'm interested to know if and when you've been told that and how that impacted you. Oh, good question. Um, here's a great example. So I played lacrosse in high school and I played it since I was a kid. Um, but it got to the point where like, there was just, there was such toxic expressions of like, <laughs> of toughness, you know, and that was something that I never fit into. I was a midfielder and midfielders. Um, yeah, I was because I could run, you know, back and forth. Um, I play offense and defense and our job a lot of times was transitioning, you know, the ball from defense to offense or, and I would take up the ball sometimes and I would, I knew I hated being hit. That was the thing. It was like, I, that was the one thing I like hated above. I don't know why I was playing lacrosse, but I was just like, I, maybe it's a little part of me that's like conflict avoidant, but I was just like, you know what? Like I can, I don't need to get hit if I can just outrun him and I know I can outrun my opponent. So I'm just going to do that. And my, my coach took notice. And so one day during a game, he pulled me aside and he was like, why are you running diagonal across the field when you bring the ball up every time? He's like, and then he like kind of looked at me. He's like, you don't want to get hit, don't you? And I was like, I was like, yeah, I was like, I just outrun him. He's like, that literally defeats the purpose of what we're doing. <laughs> he's like, you know, and, and that's, he's just, he's just, and that's when he said like, man up, man up and b b take a hit. Yeah. And I was, I like, was told know, that by my coaches. Right. And you know, it was the same thing of like, you know, water's weak. You don't need water. Are you kidding me? Like it's a hundred <laughs> degrees outside and we're in pads. Like water is weak. we could have like organ failure. Like that's not being weak. That's just super unhealthy and illegal. It's just being I reckless. Think it's just being reckless, right? Yeah. Like that's, that's just dumb. But right. anyways, I mean, I, it, it, there was a, like a lot of that stuff. And I, I think I, that was really what drove me between that and then like getting a, a series of concussions the same year from getting hit from manning up. <laughs> so you, you know, had then I was like, like real excuses. <laughs> yeah. Then I was suffering yeah. like, like actual, like, like literal brain trauma. And I was like, you know what? No, like, I don't, I don't feel like subjecting myself to this. And I was, I was also a swimmer and I had been swimming my whole life. And I was like, no, I'm going to, 
I'm going to just do swimming full time. Wow. Yeah, it, exactly. I mean, the directive to man up, it seems to always be applied to situations where a man is asking for help or he feels uncomfortable with something and uh, he just needs some further assistance or perhaps whatever he's doing is not right for him. It's a phrase used to keep men from getting the help that they need, from talking about the things that they need to talk about or expressing themselves in the way that they want to express themselves. Totally. Healthy expressions of emotion is critical. Right. That's one of the things that's like over the course of generations of this is disabled men from being able to actually have healthy expressions of emotion and healthy expressions of, of self-reflection. Oh, absolutely. And also that phrase, be a man, implies that you are not living up to some stoic, sacred standard of masculinity. And when you feel that way, it'll shut you down immediately because... There's not only pressure within you, but now there's also all this external pressure from people who very much expect you to exhibit this very rigid and unbending form of masculinity. That's, that's why I wanted to discuss that phrase. It's something that runs through the mind, however, whether it's in the front of a man's mind or somewhere in his subconscious, that phrase, be a man, is always somewhere in there. Because as a society, we've put so much weight on it, and it means so much, uh, and it keeps men from doing a lot of healthy introspection and from being their most authentic selves. I think one of the things that shows, you know, something where you've, you've really done the work to heal yourself through that is, is existing, you know, and, and doing things where that doesn't come to your mind. I'm really fortunate that I've, I've gotten to that point where I don't, I don't really ever think about that. I don't really consider it, which is strange to me because like <laughs> maybe it's part of, part of just who I am, but I never really fit into that in the first place. And I knew that I've known that my whole life. And so for me, letting go of that was maybe a little bit easier on some level than for other people. However, what is a lot more difficult is when I then am dealing where with people who are assuming <laughs> I'm supposed to be fitting into a certain expectation or a certain role, and I don't. But through my own existence, you know, through just being who I am, I'm challenging their expectations. Right. And then they assert that back on me. And then I'm like, oh, <laughs> like, uh, like, I don't, I don't, I'm sorry. Like, I don't know <laughs> what, you know, you're expecting something different, but. Yeah, no, I do the exact same thing. Uh, people, they're not, they're not quite aware of it. But when I'm posting stories on Instagram or on Snapchat and I'm showing people that I'm cooking or that I'm singing or that I'm trying to learn piano, I'm showing people, I'm trying to show everybody who knows me, and I suppose by extension the world, the, the wider world, that I am not going to be narrowly defined as this you know, stiff caricature of masculinity. I'm not just going to be out here uh, going on runs, lifting weights, uh, you know, chasing after women and going to clubs, drinking till I'm blackout. You know, Th that is not going to be the kind of man that I will be, even though that is what society has gotten used to and has learned to expect and in many ways uh, demands from boys and men. That is not who I'm going to be. And I do my most, my utmost, to show people that I am nuanced and that they can be too. That if you want to mm -hmm. take part in any range of activities, whether it's uh, highly feminine or highly masculine, as long as you're treating people with respect, as long as you feel comfortable expressing yourself, being vulnerable when you need to be, then you are a healthy individual that you can explore life and there's so much to explore. This world is so big. There's so much to do and so much to be. And so why so limit yourself? And so much more interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. You are so much more interesting, that person. Anytime I meet someone who's doing something that they're passionate about, it doesn't matter what they're doing. Yeah. But it's just that they, that it's just like, wow, you are expressing this part of who you are. And that's beautiful. And that's something that like is really interesting. And I'm therefore interested too, because like I'm learning. And I think that that's, that's just fantastic, you know? And like, 
that's what's so sad is to see like you know a lot there's so many guys who just who are so like in this box that you're like okay <laughs> yeah like they would they like, would oh, love man. to <laughs> they would love to break out of their comfort zone and they would love to sing or maybe uh enroll in dance classes do do things that people might not expect of them but they are they feel so restricted they feel like okay well my peers my family they already have this notion of who i am and if i go and do this or say that then they're going to be so taken aback so shocked and they're not going to accept me for who i want to be and that's that is the saddest thing and that is why I, I want people to unlimit themselves from that thinking. Because as you mentioned, following your heart and truly embodying your passion without restraint, without hesitancy or apprehension, saying this is what I want to do, this is who I want to be, it makes a person so much more interesting, so much more content with themselves, and makes their lives far more enjoyable they're a light for the people around them. Right. That's what's so powerful about that is that they then are, are giving other people that same energy and they're sharing that energy with other people. You know, I, I have a story about that actually. So back in high school, I decided, you know, I really want an earring. I was going to challenge what everybody at my school, all my peers considered to be manly. Right. And I already had muscles. I was going to the gym. I was on the football team. And so for me to go and do something that would be perceived as so feminine to to wear jewelry every day, a piece of jewelry was scary. It genuinely was. I remember back then actually pondering the question like, OK, I'm on the football team with like the most uh, aggressive and confrontational people in my high school. Uh, do I go and put on this earring and almost become an easy target? I am I really going to do that and be the target of their ire and uh, potentially suffer through some, some really uh, difficult bullying or, or at least some sharp comments? And I just decided to do it anyway. I decided to get the earring and to challenge those perceptions. And I didn't do it for that reason. I didn't do it to challenge gender norms. I did it because I wanted to look good. I did it because I thought I, it looked good. And sure. the very interesting thing is, when I did that, this was sophomore year of high school, I received an, a pretty warm reception when I came into the, the gym or I walked around school with the earring. I got a few snide remarks in the beginning. A few people who, when they saw it, they didn't know what to make of it. It was strange to them to see somebody who looked like me and sounded like me wearing a piece of jewelry. So there was, there was a few snide remarks, but you know what actually happened was, and this is the reason why I so want to have these conversations. What happened was a lot of guys who I thought were very narrow-minded in what they considered to be manly and would not accept anything other than that, a lot of those guys showed me respect a lot of those guys mm -hmm. complimented me on it and said, oh, that's that's pretty cool. Where'd you get it? One guy actually asked me where I where I got it so he could get an earring after me. There you go. And that, see, that is the thing. You know, when we're out there, when we're visible with the way we express ourselves, with the decisions we make that might not align with your uh, stereotypical gender traits, it actually liberates people yeah it liberates it's the people. power yeah totally i mean it that is the power of nonconformity because you are challenging just by you expressing yourself honestly you're challenging other people around you in yeah. their own constructions and perceptions and that's what's great i like i've had very similar experiences um wearing nail polish um and that's something that like can be kind of jarring for a lot of people um at one point i was even called a fat and that was like, that was pretty, pretty jarring, right? But at the same time, that I've had so many more people come up to me and be like, I love that color. That yeah. looks so good on you. Right. You know, a lot of guys too yeah, yeah. have come up to me and asked me, and they're like, oh, how do you do that? How do you paint your nails? Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, and like, that's cool because I think, I think that's the funniest part about the whole thing. It's not about, it's not about earrings. It's not about, wearing nail polish you know it's not about 
grilling steaks and playing football. It's more about how we express ourselves and how that... And feeling comfortable doing so. Yes, precisely. And because all of that is the distinction between dishonest and honest relationships. Yes, and authentic and inauthentic representations of who we are. That, that is precisely what this podcast is about. You just mentioned when you wore that nail polish, you had guys coming up to you asking you how you did it and, and maybe even trying to get some tips from you, right? That mm-hmm. right there, you just unlocked a key for somebody because he was limited, That individual was limited in how he felt he could express his creativity or his fashion sense. And when he saw you do it with how, you know, whatever degree of confidence, but you did it, you went out there, uh, I went out there with an earring. That individual said, oh, okay, we have a leader. We have somebody who is showing the way. You know, and, I, and I mean that, of course, in the context, it seems so trivial. It seems so minuscule. You're just wearing some nail polish. But when you have these very rigid constructions of what it means to be a man facing you every single day, to see somebody confidently go about their own life in clear violation of those unspoken rules, it is mind-blowing. And that is why I am so assertive and so passionate about talking about mental health, about therapy, about uh, speaking openly about how you feel about treating your partners and your friends with respect and kindness and care. Because these messages are often muted, at least in male circles, you know, this, this message of compassion. And to be somebody who sounds like me, who looks like me, who's saying this stuff, I really hope it's helping people. I hope that it is unlocking those keys for others so that they can go on and be as open, curious, creative, and compassionate as they want to be. Yeah, absolutely. I think the part of the part of the understanding this is that understanding ourselves as a a constant work in progress. I think I said this, you know, or a gist of this at the beginning, which is that, you know, we are constantly in the state of, of learning about ourselves and taking new information and processing it and growing. We also have to understand that other people are always constantly doing that too. And that's the joy of relationships is about sh- what we're doing right now, which is sharing that process, sharing where each individual is at because we're at different points, but also being able to acknowledge and understand each other in a deeper way through that and help each other through some of these things, these perhaps, you know, whatever toxic attributes you're holding inside of you, these constructions that, as you're saying, are limiting someone from being able to be more expressive, to be more true to who they are, but also be able to connect on a deeper level with the people around them. Yeah. That's really powerful. It's very powerful. And this discussion reminds me of another time where I challenged the masculine norm. Uh, Around the same time, about a year before I started rocking the earring, I decided to try out theater in my high school's drama club. I was very scared to do that. This was back when I was a freshman in high school. And I, I was a football player, and I remember circling the theater at my high school, the auditorium, and having this gut-wrenching feeling, this true fear that if I walked in there and I signed up for the winter play, this was after the fall uh, season of football, that I would be cast as ostracized, ostracized, that people would use that word on me that they used on you, fat, that they would Mm -hmm. call me a bitch, that they would call me a pussy, that they would belittle me and make my life in high school even more difficult but nonetheless there was this incredibly strong conviction in me that I had to try this I always felt inside me that I was a performer that I still feel to this day that who I really am is an actor and so I eventually signed up but I would be lying to you if I said that I was not scared every day I went to rehearsal I didn't want to be seen by anybody in my school. I would try to enter into the high school auditorium from the back so that nobody would see me enter in through the front because I did not want my football player teammates to see what I was doing. In fact, I didn't even tell anybody that I did that play for a whole year and a half afterward. Not a single person on the football team knew that I was 
in drama until I was like a junior in high school. I'm curious. So like, yeah, about that fear. So like, where did that fear come from? Like where, like, at, like what sorts of things do you look back on at, you know, that made your 14 and 15 year old self so intimidated to be, to be honest? Well, you know, I grew up with very stereotypically masculine characters around me. My father, brothers, cousins, who all displayed their masculinity in the ways you might expect. So, you know, the no-nonsense, no-emotion, uh, stay-tough kind of guys. The guys who, you know, if they saw a tear, they, they might think a little less of you. And mm -hmm. that's how I grew up. Uh, I wouldn't say, I know that there are a lot of guys who grow up in far more toxic environments where any emotion of any kind is met with disdain, ridicule. Sometimes even met with physical aggression. Yeah, so, uh, sometimes some, sometimes it's met with physical aggression. Some, some boys grow up and, mm -hmm. you know, they're smacked around for showing any kind of weakness. You know, right. people don't talk about that. Like this, men, w w it's drilled into us. And I'm not saying, like right. having resilience and, and toughness, it, ca it can be a great thing. It certainly can but, be. But, but we have to acknowledge that like resilience and toughness can be expressed in expressing emotion. Like right. crying exactly. can, be, yeah. it can be an incredible form of, of expressing resilience. Yeah, you know, and yeah. at the same time, we have to point it, we have to call that out too for what it is, which is abuse. Yes, right. Exactly. It, well, it's emotional abuse. It's, it's not constructive mm -hmm. to building a healthy, clear-headed adult. Think about that. If that is what you do to your son, to your brother, your friend, or even your boyfriend, they're going to remember that. They're going to embody that for the rest of their lives. Every time that they're dealt a particularly hard hand, when they're put in a very tough emotional spot, they are always going to reference back to that time that they got maybe smacked in the mouth for being emotional or made fun of for doing something that others perceive as feminine. Like they're always going to think back to that and think twice, maybe even four or five times before they do anything that could be perceived as emotional or feminine. So as it relates to my story with theater, that was what was going through my head. You know, I didn't want people to see me doing something that was stereotypically feminine and then characterize me as a bitch or a pussy. And even though this all took place several years ago, this stuff still happens. Even today in high schools, that same mentality persists. Yeah, uh, in, certain, in certain, yeah, absolutely, in certain circumstances. Right. In many circumstances, right? Yeah. So that's what was going through my head when I was questioning whether or not I should do theater, which is something that my heart, my heart was telling me I had to do. Sure. And when I did it, I felt so fulfilled. Well, and it gives you it gives you a sense of self confidence. It right. gives you an identity of a, a true identity, an honest an honest feeling of who you understand yourself to be, you know, and that that is empowering. Well, I couldn't agree more. Now, switching gears a little bit, I want to talk about something we've been dancing around this whole time. Something that we've been mentioning here and there, but haven't had a proper discussion on. So now I wanna ask you about toxic masculinity. This is a very contentious subject. Some people believe it doesn't exist. Some people believe it exists everywhere. So I thought it would be helpful if we just started with the definition. How would you define toxic masculinity? You know, I think, to so I, it's, toxic masculinity comes in a lot of different forms. Um, I would say toxic masculinity is an expression where, you know, someone is asserting their their gender or their sexuality in such a way where it um, is demeaning, um, hurtful, and otherwise um, it, it asserts a kind of power, I think, to certain groups of people of superiority. That kind of attitude or behavior, especially in certain environments, is encouraged or rewarded, or at least is insulated. And that's that is the real problem too when we when we broaden our scope away from an individual and we think about what is toxic masculinity because toxic masculinity can also be in an environment it's not just like maybe a personal personally held belief system right well that is certainly an insightful way to put it 
personally, I would say toxic masculinity is believing that as a male, you have to suppress emotion, never ask for help, belittle or demean others, subjugate women, or constantly rely on aggression or combativeness to express yourself. I think that is toxic. So what that means is, as long as you're not doing any of those things, you can love football, hunting, mixed martial arts, cooking steaks, or monster truck driving, and still be presenting an entirely healthy masculine image. And likewise, you can play violin, be in ballet, be, in, uh, be a thespian, you read books all the time, write books. You can, you can perform the male gender role in whatever way you see fit, but when that role starts to infringe on others' ability to express themselves, or when your belief in your own masculinity restricts you from getting the help you need and from engaging in the kind of conversations that would be constructive to you, maybe even the people you love, that is toxic. Well, and, and what you just brought up too is I think a lot of, you know, a lot of guys who um, are, don't really subscribe to some of the like hardline masculine, you know, uh, stereotypes, and perhaps you know subscribe to a, a, a little like a little more femininity and i would say i'm i'm on that spectrum i would i would lean more towards the feminine but you know there's they still have a lot of toxic masculinity constructs baked into the equation i mean i did everyone does we have to have you know people understanding them themselves in in these ways where like we can like break down the parts of themselves that are that aren't healthy that 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 uphold these 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 tenants where it's where it's like you know i can't i can't paint my nails i can't wear an earring i can't be in theater or i can't you know like what is what does that even do <laughs> like what's the point of any of that right unfortunately sometimes that also manifests itself in 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 abuse in things of, of belittling people of saying well you know what like i need to be a breadwinner I need to be a guy who just who you know in this relationship i'm making all the money and i am inadequate if my partner is making more money than i am that's so common i hear that all, unfortunately i hear that quite a bit from yeah especially from people our age who are in relationships like <laughs> i don't know yeah i mean these are the definitions the boundaries that need to be deconstructed and, and discussed <laughs> There will always be different kinds of relationships formatted different ways, but the problem comes in when you place chains around the relationship and say, as a man, I must, as the woman, I must. Yes, those expectations, absolutely. Yes. Those, those expectations are chains in a relationship. And yes. as you're talking about, like power is fluid. Yes. You know, the, the, the we have to acknowledge that like the whole point of a relationship is to have growth is to have a, a, a jointed two two people who love each other or you know who who share their own experiences and life experiences together in in mutual power and support or mutual support which then is power in a relationship well elliot i couldn't have summed it up better myself and i think offering that wisdom is a great way to end this episode Thank you so much for all your insights, your perspective, your ideas. I really do appreciate it. And I would love to continue to have this conversation sometime in the future. But until then, again, thanks for coming on the show. And I can't wait to talk to you soon. Rick, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed this discussion and all the discussions we've had so far. And I know that, you know, this is something that needs to continue for everyone, you know, and I, I really hope that people can walk away, um, you know, feeling more encouraged to be able to, to think about themselves differently and be able to, to be a lot more open to the, the people around them about this process. So thank you. That does it for this episode on what it means to be a man. Today, Elliot and I joined forces to deconstruct masculinity and reflect on how it has impacted our lives. In addition, we made critical distinctions between toxic notions of masculinity and healthy ones. Masculinity itself is by no means toxic, but I've seen and had personal experience with how a rigid view of masculinity can limit one's potential. 
That's why I needed to talk about this. To let men know that incorporating a greater degree of openness, vulnerability, creativity, and compassion into their lives is by no means a sign of weakness, but rather an indication of true courage and strength. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll see you next time.